one another, and if anyone has a complaint against another, forgive each other. Just as the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. May God bless the reading of this holy word. It wasn't that a couple of weeks ago, I think, maybe not even that much, I was getting ready to come to work, and as I'm looking in the mirror, I notice this little scar, and it's right up here in my hairline. Don't really know why I just noticed it, but I did. And a little tiny scar, and for the life of me, for the rest of the day, I couldn't think, how did I get that? I could not come up with it. Couldn't figure out where it came from. Couldn't figure out anything about it. It drove me crazy. You ever heard something like that drive you crazy? Think about it all day. And the longer you think about it, the worse it drives you crazy and gets you right in the gut. Couldn't think of it. Got tired of thinking of it. Got frustrated with it. So I went to my mom. And I said, hey, Mom, how did I get this scar on my head? I don't remember it. She said, well, you've got one just like it on your right knee. What? <laughs> so, looked up the pant leg, sure enough, I have a scar on my right knee that matches the scar above my right eye, and I still don't know how I got it. So I said, okay, Mom, this looks like a pretty significant scar. Can you tell me the story? She said, well, I can't believe you don't remember it. She said, you took a really bad fall on your bicycle when you were seven years old. We took you to the hospital for stitches in your head and your knee, and you don't remember that? Uh, no. Nope. I don't remember. So I just kind of chalked it up to the fact that, you know, I'm getting older, and they say that as we get older, we don't remember things, right, the way that we used to. I have found that I have a capacity and some goes in, and if there's already too much in here, some leaks out. Can I get an amen on that? Yeah. See, so I'm just kind of thinking, okay, that's what happened. I just forgot it. But you see, that just doesn't hold true. Because I do remember when I was five years old, day one of kindergarten. I remember that like it was yesterday, and here's why. I didn't want to go to kindergarten. They told me how fun it was going to be. They told me it's going to be great. You're going to, be, you're going to get new friends. Well, I don't want to go. So my mother says, okay, we'll buy you a new dress. I wanted to wear the new dress, but I didn't want to go to kindergarten. But I went. I picked out a bright yellow dress, put on my dress, and I went. wasn't happy, but I went, okay? I started making some new friends, and I thought this kindergarten thing might not be too bad. Until I saw a little boy in the corner, and he's pointing at me, and he's laughing. Now, I just kind of ignore it for a little while, until he continues to point, and he continues to laugh, and he comes up to me, and he says, Hey, my name is Rodney. What's your name? I said, My name's Kathy. He said, A dress is hideous. <laughs> First of all, I didn't have any idea what hideous meant, but I knew that it probably wasn't good. I knew he was probably making fun of me. And if that line didn't secure it, the second line did. He continued to laugh, continued to point, and said, you look just like Big Bird. Oh. Yeah. Bad. I had a scar on my head from a physical injury. I could not remember what it was from. But the emotional scar that I had on my heart, I can tell you, that affected me clear up to the first day of my senior year in high school. I kept asking myself, I wonder if what I'm wearing is hideous. I wonder if I look like Big Bird. Twelve years I thought that. You see, emotional scars, emotional pain, we don't see it. It doesn't really carry a scar that's visible, but we carry it, we feel it, we know it's there, and I think it's because it kind of develops a root, and it's a root of bitterness. And the longer that we allow that root of bitterness to grow and fester, the longer it will take to forgive, and the harder it's going to be to forgive. It's that root of bitterness. See, you see, forgiveness is what we're talking about today. It's our third week in a sermon series entitled Finding Joy in Your Life. And today we're looking at two very difficult phrases. Here's the first phrase, I am sorry. 
And if that's not bad enough, here's the second phrase. I forgive you. There are six words we cannot live without. So let's pray. Father God, we give you thanks for this sermon series. We give you thanks, Lord, for, for forgiveness that absolutely none of us wants to hear about today. Lord, I know this is difficult to talk about, it's difficult to preach, it's difficult to hear. But we know, Lord, that if we don't do the hard work of forgiveness, that we, we will never be rid of that bitter root. So speak to us. Use me, Lord, through this next several minutes. Use me in spite of me to help us all to move forward from bitterness through forgiveness to peace. We'll give you all the thanks and praise in Jesus' name. Okay, now the first service, folks, the mention, the, just the time. I, I only had to mention forgiveness, and everybody started squirming. Everybody started writing grocery lists. Okay, this is difficult, folks. Okay, I understand it's difficult to preach, it's difficult to talk about, and I know absolutely none of you want to hear this, which makes it extremely difficult for me. So let's take a look at what forgiveness is not, because I think we get hung up in, in forgiveness. I don't think we truly understand what it is. So let's look at some screens. Forgiveness is not a feeling. We don't wake up someday and just decide, you know what, I really, I feel like I'm going to forgive Rodney Andrews for calling me a big bird umpteen years ago. It's not a feeling. We don't just wake up and think, Okay, today's the day. I feel like it. It doesn't work that way. Second screen, Sandy. Forgiveness also is not condoning what the other person did to you. It's not saying, yes, it's okay that you did that. I forgive you. That's not what it is either. So it's not a feeling, and it's not saying that it was okay. What's the third screen? Screen screens, forgiveness is not pretending that we weren't hurt. I think we struggle with this word and we struggle with this, with this whole topic of forgiveness because we think that somehow we're saying to the person, what you did to me is okay. And that's not what we're saying at all. That's not what forgiveness is. We just looked at three things that forgiveness is not. So let's, let's look at what it is. If we go to our, our buddy Webster, Okay. Webster defines forgiveness as to give up resentment. That's freeing to us. That I can swallow. That I can deal with. To give up resentment. If we look at our scripture passage today that was read for us by Amy, can we have the next slide? The original text was in Greek. So the original text in our Colossians scripture, grace is the word that was used instead of forgive. Now let's look at our scripture using grace. Our scripture was, forgive as the Lord forgave you. It's our Colossians scripture. We are to offer grace as the Lord offered grace to us. Here's the trouble. I don't think we understand the extent of that grace that the Lord has offered to us. I don't think we understand fully what Jesus did on the cross for us. And I certainly don't think that we understand the commandment that we are given through Scripture to forgive as the Lord has forgiven us. In fact, Peter struggled with this. <laughs> Peter went to look, went to Jesus, and he said, Okay, Lord, you know, he says, How many times should I forgive my, my fellow man here if he's, if he's wronged me? And, and Peter thought he was doing really good because he said, Seven times, Lord? Seven? But guess what? What did Jesus tell him? Not seven times, but 70 times seven. Is anybody feeling any better at this point? We're not, are we? We're not feeling better. 
I want to read to you the encounter that Peter had with Jesus and the parable that that was explained. You'll find it in Matthew 18, 21 through 35. Then Peter came to Jesus and he asked, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother when he sins against me? Up to seven times? And Jesus answered, I tell you, not seven times, but 77 times. And then he tells him a parable. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanted to settle accounts. He began the settlement with a man who owed him 10,000 talents. Now, does anybody know how much 10,000 talents is? Anybody? A lot. One talent was 20 years of wage. So if you owe 10,000 talents, who could pay it? Who could pay it? No one could pay it. Since he was not able to pay, the master ordered that he and his wife and his children and all that he had be sold and repay the debt. The servant fell on his knees before him. Be patient with me, he begged, and I'll pay back everything. The servant's master took pity on him, canceled the debt, and let him go. A debt that he could not pay. But when the servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii. How much is a hundred denarii? Ross? Not quite as much. <laughs> Not quite as much. <laughs> one day's wage. One day's wage. Interesting. He grabbed him and began to choke him. Pay back what you owe me, he demanded. His fellow servant fell to his knees and begged him, Be patient with me, and I will pay you back. But he refused. Instead, he went off and had the man thrown into prison until he could pay the debt. When the other servants saw what had happened, they were greatly distressed and went and told their master everything that had happened. And then the master called the servant, You wicked servant. I canceled all the debt of yours because you begged me. Shouldn't you have had the same mercy on your fellow servant? And in anger, his master turned him over to the jailers to be tortured until he could pay back all he owed. And then Jesus said this to Peter. Remember, it was Peter who asked the question. Jesus said, This is how my heavenly Father will take each of you unless you forgive your brother from your heart. Are we feeling better yet? Not feeling better yet. You see, in this story, if you haven't figured it out already, the king represents God and we are the servant who owes Ross a lot. Jesus' point in the story is that because of our sin, we owe God an unpayable debt. And under the law, the rule was if we owe, we have to pay. God loves us so much. Because he knows there's no way that we can pay the debt. He canceled our debt when Jesus died on the cross. It's the ultimate expression that God's kingdom is grounded in his gracious forgiveness. I, I, wrote, I wrote a little sentence here. And I have it written down because I didn't want to mess it up. You know, it's that thinking thing. Some goes in, some goes out. <laughs> Forgiven people forgive. Because they experienced the forgiveness of God. But that's not always the way it works. Sometimes forgiveness just doesn't flow. If we look at verse 28 through 30, we see where the servant had received pure grace. He owes his life. The scripture says he owes his family, his possessions, and everything he has to the grace of the master. But the servant goes out and finds a man who owes him just a debt that is able to be paid, and he punishes him. Unlike the king, the servant thinks, I'm not going to do the same thing like that silly old king. I'm not going to take the hit. This man owes me. He needs to pay me. And that's the problem. We have this strong tendency to think that we can receive forgiveness, but we can't give it away, that we have to keep it for ourselves. Forgiveness is not natural. 
That's why it's essential to let God's grace take root in our hearts. Not that root of bitterness. Because we're going to get hurt. We get hurt every day. If we lay our cards on the table, we all get hurt. We hurt one another. People hurt us. We're going to get stuck. We're going to get stuck in this emotional and spiritual cement of bitterness if we don't learn to forgive. Some of you are there right now. I see it in your faces. I see it in your jitteriness in the pew. This hurts, this stuff hurts, and I don't deny it. The king in the story said, I've offered you a huge amount of grace, but you wouldn't live into it. You wanted to receive it, and then you wanted to selfishly keep it. Jesus ends this statement with verse 35. This is how my heavenly Father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother from your heart. Now, Jesus is not saying we're all going to get thrown into a torture chamber. Okay, but Jesus is saying this. Forgiveness not shown means that forgiveness is unknown. Jesus is explaining that if we are not willing to endure that surgery of forgiveness, we're going to die emotionally, spiritually, and relationally because it reveals that we have never received the grace. Tim Keller is a theologian and Christian apologist in New York City, and he has this to say, he, and I quote, we are more sinful and flawed in ourselves than we have ever dared to believe. Yet, at the same time, we are more loved and accepted in Jesus Christ than we ever <coughs> Our sins are innumerable. But God's grace is in Christ is washed away. With, he washes away every one of them. But we have to receive it. If grace takes root in our hearts, we will, by the power of the Holy Spirit, forgive those who hurt us. Because forgiven people forgive. So let me ask you this question. What does it look like? What does this type of forgiveness look like in everyday life? What does it look like to say, I'm sorry? What does it look like to say, I forgive you? On October the 2nd of 2006, Charles Carl Roberts IV carried guns and rage into an Amish schoolhouse in Nickel Mines, Pennsylvania. Five schoolgirls died that day, and five others were seriously wounded before he turned and shot himself. Roberts shattered a reassuring myth that the old order Amish remained isolated from the problems of the larger world. The schoolhouse shooting in that quiet Amish county shocked the world. And then, with the swiftness that almost that also startled the world, the Nickel Mines Amish began to forgive the killer and offer grace to his family. Even as the outsiders were responding with compassion for the Amish community, in the wake of that shooting, the Amish were doing another kind of work. Within their own hearts, softly, subtly, quietly, they were beginning that task of forgiveness. You see, the shooter left behind a widow and children of his own. They were also victims of the shooting. Victims who had not only lost a husband and a father, but they lost their privacy. Unlike the Amish victims, the Roberts family had to bear the shame of having their loved one inflict pain on innocent children. But within only a few hours of that shooting, the Amish people were reaching out to the killer's family. That same evening, an Amish man went to see the killer's father. And he later told the media that an Amish neighbor had come to comfort the family. He stood there for an hour and he held that man, Mr. Roberts, in his arms and he said these words. We forgive you. In the days that followed, Roberts' family received so many visits and calls from the Amish people that they felt the forgiveness. 
It was reported on the day that the gunman was laid to rest in the cemetery of Georgetown United Methodist Church. More than half of the 75 that attended that day were Amish. The funeral director was quoted to have said, I was lucky enough to be at the cemetery when the Amish families of the children who had been killed came to greet the widow. That's something I'll never forget, he said. It was a miracle of forgiveness. And that is what it looks like <laughs> when we say, I forgive you. So what's it look like to say, I'm sorry? So what does that look like? Within this same tragic story, Terry is the name of the mother of Carl Roberts. She was interviewed by Donald Cradle in 2010, and she shared this. The anguish I experienced was absolutely unbearable. Comprehending what my son had done took days and weeks to absorb, but however, I knew that his actions came from unforgiveness. And seeing what others experienced without forgiving, I knew this was not an option for me. He was my son, and he was full of love, but he was blinded to the love of God. I can't comprehend how this happened, and we did not see it coming. But a root of bitterness never brings peace. A root of bitterness is worse than any cancer in our body. If we hold any bitterness inside, it's important to say, I'm sorry. Let it get released from our spirit. I chose to say, I'm sorry. And that's when the healing began. If we are to find joy in our life, in this area of forgiveness, we will need to learn to say, I'm sorry. We will need to learn to say, I forgive you. But you see, we can only say that with any degree of authenticity until we have accepted the work on the cross and the forgiveness that is offered to us. Desmond Tutu is a Southern African archbishop, and he's quoted to have said this. True forgiveness deals with the past, all of the past, to make the future possible. Let's pray.